So what makes the Cellular IoT API great? Um, APIs are important to uh, be efficient in managing your SIMs, essentially. So what I want to cover here in the next um, 10 to 15 minutes is key SIM management functions that need APIs, how APIs support your business objectives, and the meat of my session will be in third part, characteristics of a great API and how to find one. In the, um, in the uh, abstract, I promised you 10 tips of what to look out for. I actually brought 16. So you get six extra tips and tricks for free included in my session today. How's that? Uh, let me go to slideshow mode. Right. So there's three ways you can manage um, IoT sims. Uh, typically, um, many of our customers are used to having a web console, you know, sing single login or multiple logins. Um, go online, uh, activate SIMs, you know, manage pull bills, things like that. Um, that's certainly the most common <clears throat> way to do it. Um, equally common, unfortunately, is going through the vendor's customer support or sales department, picking up the phone, calling your rep to order more SIMs, for instance, or activate a batch of SIMs, activate an order of SIMs that you made. Um, that's very, very common still today. The third way, which is really the ideal way, uh, if you if you grow, if you have a growing business, is to embed SIM management in your workflows, leveraging APIs. So, really, the best SIM management solution makes managing fifty thousand SIMs as easy and efficient as managing fifty. Right. So, what are uh, the things you can do, uh, and what are the things you have to do when you manage a fleet of um, of SIMs in the field? First and foremost, of course, SIM activation, deactivation. Depending on your use case, you might have a lot of um, overturn of SIMs. Um, you might want to suspend a SIM if it's currently inactive, if your device is currently inactive, so you don't incur, incur charges. Uh, you might want to activate a batch of 5,000 new SIMs that you just ordered and have uh, put into your devices in the manufacturing step, et cetera. That's, that screams for APIs, um, especially if you have a high turnover of SIMs. So whenever, let's say, a customer deactivates a device, um, <clears throat> sells it, sells a change of ownership, you need to um, you know, deactivate and reactivate SIMs all the time. Querying the status of a SIM. A SIM is typically in a, in a particular state at any given time. Um, at Twilio, for instance, with SuperSIM, we have a state called the ready state, which means that a SIM um, is functional, not uh, operable. Um, you can, you know, it, it can, it can uh, consume data, but we don't charge you for it yet. So the ready state is typically used for, uh, you know, right after your device has been manufactured, the SIM has been put into the device, and you're shipping um, to the end destination to your customer, and you don't want to pay for that, right? So we give you 250 kilobyte uh, free, we give you uh, 90 days or five SMS commands you can send to the device, whichever comes first before we start billing you. So states like that, ready, active, suspended, um, inactive that you know you want to kind of have an overview of what what the uh what your what state your sims are in network access configuration so i mentioned earlier that ideally you control which networks in which countries your devices have access to um again that's something you might want to manage through apis you might want to change a network access profile for a sim or a sim fleet um and um, you might want to just pull what, what the current uh, net, network access profile is, et cetera. You want to do that through APIs. Billing information, usage records, the classical uh, use case. Troubleshooting, uh, the ability to pull log files, um, you know, to have that deep visibility into what's going on. That's, by the way, another advantage of um, working with vendors that have their own mobile core 
is that you get deeper insight into what's happening at the network level. Uh, and oftentimes you want to actually expose that information to your end customers. If you're a IoT solution provider and you have business clients that um, consume your services, say you built a device, um, you use um, a vendor's um, SIMs, ideally you would like to expose um, status information about the network to your clients as well. So that you're transparent so that they can uh, know what's going on and um, APIs help with that specifically uh, event streams um, that that can um, kind of expose uh, what's going on in the network level and um, you can subscribe to these event streams right uh, like through Amazon Kinesis or um, uh, just web endpoints etc finally um, being able to reach a device proactively you might sometimes need to push information to a device to update a rate table, for instance, if you have a connected postage printer or whatever the use case is. Um, APIs can help there as well. So typically um, you use VPNs or traditionally you use VPNs to, um, to give each device an IP and, and be able to reach it. But um, there's other ways um, such as an API that you could hit, a REST API um, to, to send information. So again, if you're looking at vendors um, for, uh, uh, you know, for, for SIM access, um, look, look for such capabilities as well. So these are the, are the things, the features you can um, kind of leverage through APIs. Um, how do APIs help your business? Well, first, first of all, they enable that scalability, right? So. Um, at Twilio, the reason why we're so successful with startups is because they are digital natives. They get how to use APIs to their advantage. We have a lot of clients from the micro mobility sector. Um, you know, I, I, I was in uh, in Bonn, my hometown, uh, a couple of months ago, um, Bonn, Germany, and I saw that. Um, Micro mobility is huge there. Um, I saw Lime scooters. I saw scooters from Tier, uh, Beam, and a couple others. All of them actually have Twilio SuperSims in them. They're all our customers because that's a type of business that needs to scale quickly, right? The way to grow is to conquer, so to speak, new countries, new territories. Uh, you don't want to be dealing with you know different carriers in each country because otherwise you'd be dealing with, with dozens or hundreds of them. So APIs and the ability to embed, you know, all the functions I just walked you through into your existing business workflows is key um, to, to companies working in such sectors. I mentioned the ability to expose um, network status to kind of make troubleshooting more transparent um, through something like event stream. Um, that can be a big plus on the customer experience side um, for you know you again, again in the role of I'm, I'm assuming I'm speaking to a room full of uh, entrepreneurs uh, and um, technologists that are either working at companies that do something like this or maybe uh, thinking about uh, building companies uh, in, in these spaces. Um, so think about that, that aspect of the customer experience by being able to um, give you know, insight into, into what's going on behind the scenes. Um, if you are dealing with a vendor that has kind of an API first mindset, you are also typically dealing with, dealing with a vendor that um, allows more customization, for instance, around rate plans that align with your business. So that's another advantage. And finally, um, it just helps uh, with you know your day-to-day -day business operations and, and thus reduces operating expenses. Now, what are the characteristics of a great API and how do, how do you find one? Uh, first, it needs to be well-documented and easy to use. It needs to be jargon-free. Um, the telecom world is full of acronyms and um, you know full of complexities that you don't want to be dealing with if your business is really in um, uh, deploying, uh, you know, value-added solutions to, to your business customers. Um, they should have code examples, tutorials, describe use cases, 
and it needs to be kind of well maintained, almost like a product in itself, um, the documentation that is. So when you explore vendors in this space, check whether a recently announced feature has been documented yet. If the documentation is rolled out together with the public feature announcement, that's an indication that the product manager themselves may have written it, which is a good sign, right? Um, do a web search uh, for a feature to see whether the API documentation is on the first page of results. If it is, that tells you it's a page that developers actively use and that it's relevant enough for the search engine to highlight. Ask your vendor for a sample bill, sample log file. Can you understand them? Can you easily translate them into useful information? Those are ways to find out if the API is well documented and easy to use. Put the URL of a documentation page into archive.org <laughs> to see what has changed in the last year or two. Have they added examples, fixed errors, given more detailed explanations, right? Next, they have to be backward compatible, of course. Uh, your devices will live for years in the field. Uh, some, some deployments, you know, you, you might plan for a lifespan of 10 years. Even on a single battery charge, your devices could live in the field for years. A good API has few to no breaking changes. So look at the API versioning. An API with many versions that are no longer supported uh, are likely more volatile. And, you know, if they don't have any history of when support ended. Search for blog posts or news items about breaking changes for that API. Your APIs need to be reliable and highly available under stress. Um, check for service level agreements. Ask your vendor, do you offer SLAs that guarantee me the uptime and performance of the API themselves? Not just the uptime of my SIM, but the uptime of the API, because the API, once you've integrated it into your workflows, is crucial to running your business successfully and smoothly. Find out if there are maintenance windows. Can you do a SIM activation API call during that time? What could cause your usage reporting to be delayed? How often do maintenance windows occur and how long do they last? Ask those questions, get the answers in writing. You'd be surprised, you might have a vendor offering APIs, uh, but then you know, you're know you trying to activate a SIM at a non-opportune time and that breaks the API call. Now you have to manage, did, I, did, did, that, did that activation API call actually go through successfully? Search for a vendor status page. Is there a developer port or a public listing of metrics related to outages and uptime? Have they had recent big outages? Do they provide root cause analysis or publish reasons for outage? When something goes wrong, you're looking for an honest, detailed explanation that assures you that things will improve. <clears throat> Get the vendor's request limits. How many API requests can you make per second? Or how many concurrent API requests can you make? If they don't know, that tells you a lot about the quality of their API. <clears throat> APIs should attract an active developer community. Ask your developers if they've ever heard of the vendor you're evaluating. The answer will tell you how developer friendly and developer focused they are. Research vendor communications with the developer community. Do they send regular updates? Can you subscribe to a product newsletter? Do they run regular webinars on new features? What's the cadence of product announcements? Do they maintain a public change log? What documentation do they deliver on release date to encourage people to build? An API needs to be well supported. Look at the support plans. Is developer mentioned as a category? If so, what support does it include? Find out which support channels are offered for free. Is it just email? Or can you use chat or even voice in a free plan? Okay. So with that, um, I want to leave it here and open it up to any questions you might have. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tobias. <laughs> I have to admit, I love the tips. 
I, I think it's a great cheat sheet for a lot of your competitors. The one I think that's particularly mean is ask your developer, have they heard of them? You know, <laughs> being the top dog in the industry, it's like, of course, I've heard of you. <laughs> But any questions? You think that's why I put that one in? <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Go for it. Um, I, think, I think the idea of having a trillion mobile core in three spots on, on the planet, with that mobile core connect to the couple of hundred of actually carriers with that mobile core. So how, how is that working? I, okay. With latency especially, because it was mentioned that the disadvantage is the latency because if you have local access to whatever mobile core, you're fast having that, I don't know, overlay mobile core, Twitter mobile core, make, to me it sounds, it makes it slow. So the question, uh, Tobias, was... Um, with the uh, three uh, mobile cores that uh, Twilio implements, how does how does that relate to the carrier's mobile cores? So it, it, you know, it's a SIM connecting to your mobile core, then through the carrier's mobile core. The question is trying to look at from an architectural perspective: is that actually adding in delay by it going through your mobile core first? Um, you do get better latencies um, when you go direct. Yes, lower latencies. Um, it is adding a little bit. Um, think of it as the advantage being a level playing field for a global deployment, right? If, you're, if you don't care about um, deploying in many different countries, um, you need to look at, um, you know, again, at the pros and cons. You also need to look at your use cases. Not every use case needs ultra low latency. Um, the latency that you get with, um, with Twilio's mobile core covers use cases as diverse as um, sensors deployed in the field to um, uh, video. Uh, so we also do high bandwidth um, use cases. So, um, there's no kind of straight answer. It does add latency, but the overall latency is, um, you know, is is such that it supports most of the use cases out there. And uh, at the end of the day, it, it's up to you um, testing whether that's um, sufficient for your use case. Okay, man. Okay. Excellent. Go for it, Tim. Yeah, great presentation. Do, I don't know if you hear me, but does to Tobias find situations where beyond the kind of high level control that we talked about, where developers want more granular control. Okay. So did you hear that, Tobias? Uh, please repeat. Yep, no problem. So the question is, do you see developers wanting more fine grain control over uh, the network beyond just simply uh, connectivity? Um, not beyond what we provide. Um, developers that come to us basically come to us to do the things I listed here in the second presentation um, <clears throat> of um, you know SIM management, um, pulling bill billing records, usage records, um, and uh, and troubleshooting. And what they what they like is that they actually get more visibility than they would um, from a carrier typically. Um, because we own the mobile core and devices go through our mobile core um, <clears throat> uh, first and foremost, and the mobile core is not a monolithic thing, right? There's different servers with different functions involved. And we could, you know, uh, there's, there's actually a white paper we published about uh, mobile cores in general. So if you're interested in, in that topic, I can um, send through so the URL for that white paper or you Google it. Um, <clears throat> but um, we don't see developers needing more access than what we provide, which is, you know, let me control which SIM gets uh, gets to connect to which network where. Um, let me control, let me um, see. Um, if you look at the event stream API that we have, you get a lot of metadata around each SIM. Uh, latitude and longitude of the cell tower it's connected to, um, start time of the data session, end time of the data session, uh, bytes consumed, um, things like that. So uh, radio access type. Um, so I'd encourage you to look at our documentation, which is public, and and see if um, 
if you're missing anything. But from my experience, um, since we already provide more than typical um, vendors in the space, no, they don't, they don't want even more. Cool. That's excellent and clear. Thanks, Tobias. So again, round of applause for an excellent presentation. <laughs>